The night was as dark as the depths of a grave. The kind of darkness that swallows everything in its path. The only source of light was the faint glow of my car's headlights cutting through the thick, inky blackness of the highway. I gripped the steering wheel, my knuckles white with tension, as I navigated the desolate road. My phone had long since lost its signal, and I had no choice but to rely on the road signs that appeared at sporadic intervals. I had been driving for hours, chasing the elusive promise of escape from the troubles that haunted me. My mind was a whirlwind of regrets and fears, and the empty highway seemed like the perfect place to lose myself. But as the miles stretched on, I began to feel a growing sense of unease. It was as if the very road itself had come alive, whispering secrets to me in the hollow wind. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that something lurked in the shadows just beyond the reach of my headlights. I told myself it was just my imagination, a byproduct of the isolation and exhaustion. But deep down, I knew it was something more. As I drove further into the night, a dense fog began to roll in. Obscuring the road ahead, my heart raced, and I slowed down to a crawl, straining to see through the thick mist. Shapes and shadows danced in the periphery of my vision, and I couldn't help but feel that they were closing in on me. And then I saw her. A figure shrouded in the fog appeared in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes, my heart in my throat, as I watched her come into focus. She was a young woman. Her tattered dress clinging to her emaciated frame, her eyes were empty voids, and her skin was as pale as death itself. I rolled down my window, my voice trembling as I called out to her, "Are you okay? Do you need help?" But she didn't respond. She simply stood there, staring at me with those empty eyes. I felt a shiver run down my spine. And a cold dread settled in the pit of my stomach. I hesitated for a moment, unsure of what to do, and then, with a sudden burst of speed, she lunged at my car. I screamed, slamming my foot on the gas pedal, and the tires screeched as I swerved around her. I glanced in my rearview mirror, but she was gone, swallowed up by the fog. My heart was pounding, and I continued to drive. My hands trembling on the steering wheel, I couldn't shake the feeling that I had just narrowly escaped something truly sinister. As the fog began to thin, I spotted a sign up ahead. It read, "Welcome to Harrowsville." Relief washed over me as I realized I had reached a town, a place of refuge from the horrors of the highway. I pulled into the gas station on the outskirts of town. The fluorescent lights flickering overhead. Inside the station, I found an elderly attendant behind the counter. He looked up at me with tired eyes as I approached. "Long drive, huh?" he said, his voice rasping. I nodded, my nerves still on edge from the encounter with the woman in the fog. "Yeah, it's been a strange night." The attendant gave me a sympathetic smile. You are not the first one to have a strange night on this highway. Harrowsville has a way of bringing out the oddities. I couldn't help but feel a chill at his words, but I brushed it off as a simple warning about the fog and the strange locals. I paid for my gas and headed back to my car, determined to put the highway behind me. As I drove through the town, I couldn't help but notice how quiet and deserted it seemed. The buildings were old and decrepit. Their windows boarded up, and there were no signs of life on the streets. It was as if the town had been abandoned long ago. I continued to drive, my unease growing with each passing minute. And then I saw her again—the same woman from the highway, standing in the middle of the road. I slammed on the brakes, my heart pounding in my chest. But this time, I didn't swerve around her. As my car came to a stop, she turned to face me, her empty eyes locking onto mine. And then, with a slow, deliberate movement, she raised her hand and pointed to the road ahead. I followed her gaze, and my blood ran cold. 
In the distance, I could see the highway stretching on, disappearing into the fog. But there was something different about it now. It was no longer the road I had been driving on. Instead, it was a never-ending expanse of darkness, a void that seemed to stretch on for eternity. I turned to the woman, my voice trembling. What is this place? Where am I? She didn't answer. Instead, she simply stepped aside, allowing me to pass. As I drove onto the endless highway, I realized the truth. I was trapped. The highway was a nightmarish loop, a never-ending cycle of terror and despair. No matter how far I drove, no matter how fast I went, I would never escape. The woman in the fog had shown me the way, but it was a path to nowhere. And so, I continued to drive, haunted by the horrors of the highway, trapped in a never-ending nightmare, with no hope of escape. Ever since I was a child, I've always been fascinated by twins. There's something inherently eerie about the idea of two people who share the same face, the same DNA, and the same secrets. But my fascination turned to dread the day I moved into a new house in a quiet, remote town. The house was old, its time-worn facade hiding the many stories it held within its walls. I was thrilled with the place, but from the moment I stepped inside, a chill settled in my bones. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but there was something deeply unsettling about the house. My unease only grew when I learned about the twins who had once lived there. They were identical sisters, Mary and Margaret, who had been inseparable from birth. The townsfolk spoke of them in hushed tones, recounting stories of their strange behavior and their eerie bond. It was said that Mary and Margaret never spoke to anyone but each other, communicating in a language all their own. They were rarely seen apart, their identical dresses and long, dark hair, making them an unsettling sight to behold. But the most disturbing rumor was the one that whispered of their shared dreams. They have visions, an old woman in town had told me. Her eyes wide with fear. They dream of things that haven't happened yet, terrible things. I dismissed the tales as mere superstition, the stuff of urban legends and small-town gossip. But as the days turned into weeks, I couldn't ignore the growing sense of unease that had settled over me. One night, as I lay in my bed, I heard a soft, murmured conversation coming from the room next door. I strained my ears, trying to make out the words, but it was as if they were speaking in a foreign tongue. I crept out of bed and pressed my ear against the wall, listening to the strange, melodic cadence of their voices. Mary, do you see it too? Margaret's voice was barely a whisper. Yes, I see it, Mary replied. It's coming for us. Fear gripped my heart as I listened to their conversation. What were they talking about? What did they see? I couldn't shake the feeling that whatever they were discussing was something malevolent, something that threatened not only them, but the presence of me in the house. The following morning, I decided to confront them. I knocked on their bedroom door, my voice trembling as I called out to them. Mary, Margaret, can I come in? There was a long, eerie silence before they finally responded. Yes, come in. I pushed open the door and found them sitting on the edge of their beds, their identical faces fixed in an expressionless gaze. Their eyes were empty voids, and it sent a shiver down my spine. What were you two talking about last night? I asked, my voice shaking. They exchanged a glance. A silent conversation passing between them before Mary finally spoke. Just dreams, nothing more. I pressed them for more information, but they remained tight-lipped, their secrets buried deep within their mysterious bond. As the days passed, my fear of the twins only grew. I couldn't shake the feeling that they were hiding something, something dark and dangerous. And then, one night, I had a dream of my own. In the dream, 
I was standing in the middle of a dark forest, the moon casting eerie shadows on the gnarled trees. I heard the sound of footsteps approaching, and I turned to see Mary and Margaret standing before me. Their eyes glowed with an otherworldly light, and their voices were a haunting chorus. Join us, they whispered in unison. Join us in the dream. I woke up in a cold sweat, my heart pounding in my chest. It was just a dream, I told myself, but the feeling of dread lingered. And then, as I lay in bed, I heard their voices again, softly murmuring in the room next door. I couldn't resist the urge to eavesdrop, to listen in on their mysterious conversations. I crept out of bed and pressed my ear against the wall, my heart pounding in my chest as I listened to their words. Margaret, do you hear it? Mary's voice was filled with fear. Yes, I hear it, Margaret replied. It's here. I couldn't make sense of their cryptic conversation, but I knew one thing for certain. Whatever they were talking about was real, and it was coming from me. The next morning, I decided to leave the house, to escape the suffocating presence of the twins and their ominous dreams. But as I packed my bags, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, that their identical faces were staring at me from the shadows. I made my way to the front door, my hand trembling as I reached for the handle. And then, with a sudden burst of clarity, I realized the truth. I was the twin. I had been living in the shadow of my own existence, haunted by the specter of Mary and Margaret. The dreams I had heard, the voices I had listened to, they were all reflections of my own fears and insecurities. The twins were not the source of the darkness. It was within me all along. I stepped out of the house, leaving behind the twins and their mysterious world. As I walked away, I couldn't help but wonder if I had escaped the darkness or simply embraced a different kind of nightmare, the one that lurked within my own mind. The glow of my phone screen pierced the darkness of my bedroom as I lay in bed, lost in the endless scroll of social media. It was past midnight, but I couldn't tear myself away from the intoxicating allure of social media. My obsession with virtual lives had taken over my own, and I was drowning in a sea of carefully curated images and meticulously crafted stories. I had always prided myself on being a social media aficionado, chasing likes and followers like a digital high. But lately, it had become an addiction, consuming my every waking moment and infiltrating my dreams. Friends had become avatars, and experiences had been reduced to hashtags. My real life was slipping away, and I couldn't see the darkness creeping in. That night, as I scrolled through an endless stream of posts, a peculiar image caught my attention. It was a photo of me, but not one I had ever taken or posted. I stared in disbelief as I recognized myself in the dimly lit room, asleep in my bed, my phone resting on my chest. The caption beneath the image read, caught in the web. Chills raced down my spine as I tried to rationalize what I was seeing. Had someone broken into my room? Was this a cruel prank? I frantically tapped the image, trying to trace it back to its source, but the post had no tags, no location. It was as if it had materialized out of thin air. Fear and paranoia gnawed at me as I locked my phone and scanned my room for any signs of intrusion. Everything seemed normal, and the door was locked from the inside. I told myself it was a sick joke, a hack, and forced myself to put it out of my mind. But as the hours passed, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Sleep eluded me that night, and I watched the darkness outside my window turn gray. I decided to confront the bizarre post and headed to the bathroom to splash some water on my face. As I flicked on the light, I gasped in horror at my reflection. The face staring back at me was not my own. It was twisted and contorted, with hollow eyes that seemed to bore into my soul. I stumbled back, my heart pounding in my chest, but the reflection remained distorted. Panic surged through me as I fumbled for my phone to document the nightmare. 
but the device was dead, its screen blank. Desperation clawed at me as I raced back to my bedroom and plugged in my phone. The moment it powered on, I received a flood of notifications. My heart sank as I realized that the photo had gone viral, with thousands of comments and shares. People were speculating about the bizarre image, suggesting everything from a ghostly presence to a digital glitch. I scrolled through the comments, my heart pounding with each word. Some users claimed to have seen similar images, while others insisted it was a prank or a publicity stunt. But one comment caught my eye, a cryptic message from a user with no profile picture or followers. It simply read, the web never forgets. I felt a growing unease as I clicked on the user's profile, but it was empty, devoid of any posts or information. It was as if the account had been created just to send me that eerie message. My phone buzzed with a new notification, a direct message from the same user. What do you see when you look in the mirror? The message read. My hands trembled as I typed a response. Who are you? What do you want? The response was swift. You've been captured by the web. To escape, you must confront your digital self. Confusion and fear overwhelmed me as I stared at the screen. What did it mean? My reflection in the bathroom mirror had been distorted. But what did that have to do with social media? I had no answers, only a growing sense of dread. As the days passed, I became increasingly paranoid. I noticed strange occurrences on my social media accounts. Images of me appearing in places I had never been. Status updates I had not written. It was as if someone or something was impersonating me online, blurring the line between reality and the virtual world. The web had become a nightmarish labyrinth, and I was trapped within its dark corridors. I tried to disconnect, to delete my accounts, but my online presence seemed to have a life of its own. Messages and notifications flooded in, taunting me with cryptic messages and distorted images. I grew more isolated, my friends and family unable to comprehend the terror that had consumed me. The lines between my physical and digital self blurred further as I saw glimpses of my distorted reflection in the real world. My face contorted in the windows of passing cars, my eyes hollow in the reflections of shop windows. One night, as I lay in bed, unable to sleep, I received a final message from the enigmatic user. You cannot escape the web. You are its prisoner forever. I threw my phone across the room, unable to bear the torment any longer. As it clattered to the floor, the screen shattered and the notifications ceased. But the damage was done. I was forever entangled in the web, a prisoner of my own digital obsession, a distorted reflection of my former self, lost in the dark corridors of the virtual world. And so I remain a ghostly presence in the digital realm, forever trapped in the twisted mirror of social media, my true self lost to the insatiable hunger of the web. Beware the allure of the virtual world, for once you are captured, there is no escape, and you become a prisoner of the darkness that lurks within the pixels and code. The school bathroom had always been a place of mystery and whispers, a grimy sanctuary where secrets were shared and fears were faced. It was a place where I had heard countless tales of ghostly encounters and eerie experiences, but I never truly believed them until that fateful day. It was a typical afternoon at Fairview High School, the halls buzzing with students rushing to their next class. As I made my way to the bathroom, I couldn't help but overhear hushed conversations about the legend of Bloody Mary, a ghostly apparition said to appear in the mirror if you chanted her name three times. It was a childish superstition, and most students scoffed at the idea. Entering the bathroom, I was greeted by the usual sights and sounds, the flickering fluorescent lights, the creaking stall doors, and the distant hum of the ventilation system. It was eerily quiet for a school restroom, and a shiver ran down my spine 
as I approached the row of grimy mirrors. I couldn't resist the temptation to test the legend. In a hushed voice, I muttered, Bloody Mary once. Nothing happened. Emboldened, I said it a second time, my voice growing slightly louder. Still, there was no response. With a nervous chuckle, I decided to go all in. I took a deep breath and said, Bloody Mary three times, staring intently into the mirror as I did. The seconds ticked by, and I rolled my eyes, dismissing the legend as nonsense. Just as I turned to leave, a chilling gust of icy wind swept through the bathroom, extinguishing the lights. Panic set in as I fumbled for my phone, its faint glow providing the only source of light. The bathroom was pitch black, and the air seemed to grow colder with each passing second. Suddenly, a whisper echoed through the darkness. It was faint at first, barely audible, but it grew louder with each repetition. Help me! Help me! My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to see through the darkness. The voice seemed to be coming from the mirrors themselves, as if they were portals to another realm. I could feel a presence, a malevolent force that surrounded me, closing in. Who's there? I stammered, my voice trembling. Help me. Help me. I couldn't resist the compulsion to answer, how can I help you? The whispers grew louder, and I could see the faint outline of a figure in the mirror. It was a girl, her eyes hollow and her skin pallid. She reached out her ghostly hand passing through the glass as if it were water. You have to find my locket, she whispered. It's hidden in the school, and it's the only way to set me free. Before I could respond, the lights flickered back on and the chilling presence vanished. I was left standing in the dimly lit bathroom, my heart still racing, wondering if what I had just experienced had been real or merely a hallucination. Determined to uncover the truth, I set out on a quest to find the girl's locket. The legend of Bloody Mary had taken on a whole new dimension, and I couldn't ignore the call for help I had heard in that eerie bathroom. Over the course of weeks, I searched every nook and cranny of the school, following cryptic clues that led me deeper into the mystery. The locket was said to hold the key to the girl's release, but as I delved further into the riddle, I couldn't help but wonder if I was being lured into a trap. One night, as I ventured into the school's abandoned basement, I finally found the locket hidden in a dusty, forgotten corner. It was a small, tarnished piece of jewelry, but it held an air of significance. Holding it in my trembling hands, I knew I had to return to the bathroom to complete the task. As I entered the restroom once more, a sense of foreboding washed over me. The lights flickered and the temperature dropped. The whispers began anew, echoing through the bathroom, growing louder with each step I took. I approached the mirror, clutching the locket tightly. I have it, I said, my voice unwavering. The ghostly figure appeared, her eyes filled with desperation. Give it to me, she pleaded. But before I could react, a voice rang out from behind me, a voice I recognized all too well. It was my best friend, Emma, the one who had told me about the legend of Bloody Mary in the first place. Give me the locket, she demanded, her eyes filled with an unsettling mix of determination and malice. I hesitated, torn between the girl in the mirror and the friend I had known for years. Emma's insistence grew more intense, and I realized with a shock that she had known about the locket all along. She had lured me into this twisted game, and now she wanted the power it held for herself. As I held the locket in my hand, I had to make a choice. A choice that would determine the fate of the girl in the mirror and the destiny of my friend. The bathroom seemed to close in around me, the whispers growing louder, the pressure unbearable. And then, with a final, heart-wrenching decision, I placed the locket into the hands of the ghostly girl. The room trembled, and the mirror shattered, 
sending shards of glass flying in all directions. The lights flickered and dimmed, and then, with a deafening roar, they went out. When the lights returned, the bathroom was empty and I was alone. Emma was gone, as if she had never existed and the girl in the mirror had been set free. As I left the bathroom, I couldn't help but wonder about the girl's true identity and the darkness that had bound her to that place. Had I made the right choice, I would never know. But one thing was certain. The legend of Bloody Mary was far more than just a childhood superstition. It was a twisted tale of secrets, betrayal, and the chilling power of the unknown. Vacations were supposed to be an escape from reality, a chance to unwind and leave behind the worries of everyday life. That's why I was so excited when my friends and I decided to rent a secluded cabin in the woods for a week-long getaway. Little did I know that our vacation would turn into a nightmare beyond our wildest imagination. The cabin, nestled deep in the forest, was everything we had hoped for. Rustic, charming, and surrounded by nature in all its glory. The trees stretched high into the sky, their leaves forming a dense canopy that blocked out the sun. The air was thick with the scent of pine and the sound of chirping birds. The first few days of our vacation were idyllic. We hiked through the woods, swam in the nearby lake, and spent evenings by the campfire, sharing stories and laughter. It was everything we had dreamed of, a perfect escape from the stress of our daily lives. But on the fourth day, things began to change. It started with a strange sensation, a feeling of being watched. I dismissed it as paranoia, the result of too many horror movies and campfire tales. But as the days went by, the feeling only grew stronger. One evening, as we sat around the campfire, we heard a rustling in the bushes nearby. We brushed it off as an animal, but then the rustling turned into footsteps, slow, deliberate, and unmistakably human. We all turned to look, our hearts pounding in our chests, but there was nothing there. The forest was dark, and the trees seemed to close in around us. I couldn't shake the feeling that someone, or something, was lurking in the shadows. That night, as I lay in my bunk, I heard it, a faint whisper that seemed to come from the walls themselves. I strained to make out the words, my heart racing as the voice grew louder. Leave, before it's too late. I sat up, my breath coming in short, shallow gasps. The voice was coming from the cabin's walls, as if the very wood itself was speaking to me. I woke my friends, but they dismissed my fears as a result of exhaustion and the remote location. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The next day, we decided to go for a hike to take our minds off the eerie events of the previous night. As we ventured deeper into the woods, we stumbled upon an old, dilapidated cabin hidden among the trees. It was a decrepit, long-forgotten structure that looked as if it had been abandoned for years. Despite our better judgment, we couldn't resist the urge to explore. The cabin was a treasure trove of the past. Old photographs, faded letters, and tattered diaries that spoke of a family that had once called this place home. But as I flipped through the pages of one particularly old diary, I discovered something that sent a chill down my spine. The diary belonged to a woman named Eleanor, who had lived in the cabin with her husband and two children. Her entries grew increasingly erratic, filled with ramblings about strange occurrences in the woods and a growing sense of dread. She wrote of whispers in the night, of voices that seemed to come from the very walls of the cabin. And then, in her final entry, Eleanor wrote of a terrible choice she had made to leave her family behind and flee into the woods to escape the horrors that had consumed them. She begged for forgiveness, her words filled with regret and despair. I showed the diary to my friends, and we couldn't help but draw a connection between Eleanor's story and our own experiences. The feeling of being watched, the whispered warnings, the eerie voices, 
It was all too familiar. That night, as we returned to our cabin, the atmosphere had changed. The air was heavy with tension, and the sense of foreboding was palpable. We locked the doors and windows, but it was as if the darkness outside was seeping in through the cracks. The whispers grew louder, the voices more insistent. We could hear our own names, as if someone or something was calling to us from the shadows. Panic set in as we realized that we were not alone in the cabin, that the presence that had haunted us had followed us home. We huddled together, our hearts pounding, as the walls themselves seemed to come alive with whispers. The voices spoke of a terrible choice, a decision that we had to make to escape the horrors that had consumed us. And then, with a deafening roar, the cabin seemed to tremble. The walls shook and the windows shattered as a powerful force swept through the room. It was as if the very wood itself had turned against us, a malevolent entity that sought to consume our very souls. We had no choice but to flee, to escape the cabin and the darkness that had taken hold of it. As we ran through the woods, the whispers followed us, growing louder and more insistent with each step. And then, with a final heart-wrenching decision, we made our choice. We returned to the cabin, determined to confront the entity that had haunted us. As we entered the darkened room, we could feel its presence closing in around us, the whispers reaching a fevered pitch. And then, with a blinding flash of light, the darkness was gone. The cabin was empty, the malevolent force banished, as if it had never existed. We were left standing in the dimly lit room, shaken but alive. As we left the cabin behind, I couldn't help but wonder about the entity's true nature and the darkness that had consumed it. Had we made the right choice? I would never know. But one thing was certain. Our vacation had turned into a nightmare beyond our wildest imagination, and the truth was more chilling than anything we could have ever imagined.